It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. As we finally while away the days and now can start to zero in on what should be a very good Super Bowl between the uh, favorite Niners, who are right now uh, pretty much a solid two-point favorite over the defending champion Chiefs. Uh, and remember, Bet Rivers is right there with everything that you need. And Bet Rivers is offering a second chance bet on your first same game parlay on the big game. Place a qualifying same game parlay on the big game. If your bet loses, you get a bonus bet equal to your wager. You can't beat that. With your same game parlay bet, you also earn a square. And you're involved in those squares, just like you are probably in some box in some bar somewhere, that you can be can be worth as much as ten thousand dollars in bonus money for a ten dollar wager. You can't beat that anytime, anywhere. So see the Bet Rivers app, the new and improved Bet Rivers app for full details and bet on the big game at Bet Rivers. We are now days away uh from Super Bowl, the Super Bowl in Vegas, and you're already hearing things about Vegas that I told you would happen months ago, how how much traffic there is. They haven't even got everybody in town yet, folks. Most people won't even be there till Friday. How much traffic there is, how overcrowded things are, how expensive, insanely expensive everything is. So... This was going to be the Super Bowl that wasn't for. Super Bowls are not for everyday fans anyway because nothing is cheap. The NFL gouges everybody. They are the worst gouges of all, and everybody involved, everybody who has anything to do with the Super Bowl gouges. So the bottom line is it's expensive when you put it in a city that is quiet. When you put it in the entertainment capital, which is what Vegas is, when you put it there in a city that thrives and pulsates like Vegas, it becomes insanely expensive. The ticket price, which has been bumped up on the face extraordinarily, is outrageous. The hotel rooms are insanely expensive if you can get one. And anywhere you move, you're going to be a third-class citizen. So it, it, it's going to be, if you went there, and I used to see fans all the time and said, oh, I just came in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scalp a ticket. Hey, you're not scalping tickets for this thing unless you're paying an absolute king's ransom for the game. That's all there is to it. This is not a Super Bowl to go to if you are not connected. You know, if you know somebody from one of the teams or you know somebody that is hooked up, well, that's fine. If you don't, make it another year because this will not be your finest experience. I would, I would prob- promise you that. Now, a couple things here. I'm not big on all these thousands, myriad, okay, of Super Bowl propositions. I know people love them. Bet Rivers has got a thousand of them. Everybody has a thousand of them. God bless them. And I have no problem with anybody who likes to wager on them. It's just not my thing, Okay. The, yeah, I just can't get involved in all, 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 the, all the craziness. I mean, they think anything you've ever thought of, they have a, a proposition for. But here's one that I always laugh about. They give you all these reasons as people come up with, and they analyze every facet of this game. Oh, I'm going to give you a great value to bet this guy as the MVP. Hey, just realize Look at history. The team that wins, the MVPs now automatically coming from their side. That's number one. Don't think a losing guy's winning the Super Bowl Bowl MVP. It's not. Number two, unless the quarterback stinks up the building in a winning effort, he is an odds-on favorite to win the MVP. If he is a superstar quarterback like you have in this game with Mahomes, who has become a fixture on Super Sunday, it is almost impossible to get the MVP trophy away from him. If a wide receiver catches two touchdown passes and you think, oh, that guy, he's going to win the MVP at, you know, X to one, 
Hey, who threw those touchdown passes? He's getting the MVP. Now, Kelsey has as much glamour wrapped around him as a player can right now because of everything that's going on with Taylor Swift. And also the fact that you have two stars at tight end who have been talked about and measured and everything else. Because let's be honest, Kittle brings a lot to the table as a, as a tight end. He doesn't catch as many passes, and he isn't an integral, as integral a part of the offense as is Kelsey. But he's an, also a phenomenal blocker. So he is a wonderful player and can be measured against any other tight end. But Kelsey is the star here because of the Taylor Swift connection. Still, A, he's going to have to catch 10 passes, score twice, and get 150 yards. Otherwise, Mahomes is going to be the MVP. Because if Mahomes threw two to Kelsey, all he had to do was either score one or throw another one in there and complete some other passes to somebody, throw for over 200 yards, he's getting the MVP. That's it. He's going to win it. So go to a different proposition. Don't try to find the long shot for the MVPs because for the winning side, the quarterback, especially of Mahomes, is going to win the MVP. That's all there is to it. So save your money or put it somewhere else. The things I do find interesting is, I do find this interesting because this is, to me, part of analyzing the game. And I, and I like to always do a couple of these before the games because it's to me, it's how I sit down and analyze the game. Okay, I think they're going to take this guy away or I think they're going to try to take this guy away. So this guy's not going to have a great game today. So where's the offense coming from on that side, okay? Then I look to the guys that can do that, and you look at their, either if they're a wide receiver, their number of receptions and the yardage they get. Or the better value a lot of times is in the guys who they ignore. So the guy only has, you only have to get 18 yards of receptions for that guy to get to, clear, to ring the bell. Hey, you can make a case that they're going to do this and he's going to be wide open and catch two or three balls for 50, 60 yards. Boom. He's, he's, his overrun is 18 yards. That works. The backup running backs work in terms of yardage, in terms of catches a lot of times because they're utilized a lot more than you think. And on certain teams, the secondary tight ends work a lot. Because their all runners might be one and a half receptions and, and 15 yards of real estate. So those numbers interest me. I rarely go in anywhere near the quarterback numbers because they're so, they're so automatic. It's the break-even point is always one and a half touchdowns thrown. You know that a Mahomes is going to run the ball, but now so is Purdy. So, you know, you know that that number is going to be somewhere in the 20s that he has to run the ball for. So he, he, that could be one run. That could be a day where he doesn't get a whole lot of runs. And you know that you have a guy like McCaffrey who's automatic. I mean, you know, if San Francisco is going to score, McCaffrey's going to score a touchdown. You know that going in, but you're not getting any value in that thing. You're not getting any value going near Mahomes. You're not getting any value going near McCaffrey. There's a reason for that. And you're not getting a whole lot of value going near Kelsey. I would definitely pay attention to Rice, as I've told you all year. Rice is going to be a key, key. Rice and Ayuk are going to be, I think, the key wide receivers in this game. How much do they get out of Rice? How much do they get out of Ayuk? To me, those, they're going to go in and they're going to try and take Debo away. Okay, Kittle's going to get some catches, but they know that going in. Kelsey's going to get some catches, but they know that going in too. Rice? Ayuk, to me, are the two key guys that will make or break these offenses in this game. And Rice can be an extremely, if you've watched them, can be an extremely explosive okay, guy. Plus, Valdez Cantley, who you always have to wonder about when he's going to catch the ball, he is going to get an opportunity in every game, at least two, sometimes three opportunities to catch one long pass. His overrun is about 18 yards. Hey, 
the routes he runs, he's going to run two or three routes where he's going to be the guy that he's looking for, and he's going to be 30, 35 yards down the field. He only has to catch one of them. No, that's the bottom line. He's only got to catch one of them. Last week, he caught the one that ended the game. So, the, and he's been hit or miss with his catches this year. But in the playoffs so far, he's made some good catches. He really has. And Kelsey's played a lot better. He's, he's, he looks like the old Kelsey. The game he played against the Ravens was sensational. Absolutely sensational. Really was. I mean, I, I thought it was a, a really sensational game in a lot of ways. I mean, he's played, he's played like his old self in the postseason. You got to give him credit for that. And he had a – whatever was wrong, I don't know. And, you know, people want to blame it on things like, like uh, Taylor Swift and stuff. That's silly. He's obviously been banged up without any question, okay? Uh, but he has really done some, some good work in the postseason. He really has. You got to be very impressed by what he's done in the uh, in the postseason. Very impressed. And the bottom line is, you know, he's still an integral part of everything they do. You know, they they expect that. You know, so you're talking about him having five catches for 75 yards and two touchdowns in the Buffalo game, and then coming back with. What I thought, not, and because he made hard catches, 11 catches for 116 and a touchdown in the Raven game. Now, obviously, all of that was in the first half. He had, he had nine for 96 and a touchdown in the first half. He only had two catches for 20 yards in the second half, but they never moved the ball an inch in the second half. They held on for dear, dear life. I mean, Kansas City didn't score in the second half. Their defense getting some big turnovers. And I still go back to reiterate that I really believe, and I picked the Chiefs in both games. I really believe that had the Flowers ball been ruled a touchdown, now he definitely started to lose it before he closed, he hit the goal line. Had he hit the goal line before he started to lose it and that had been ruled a touchdown instead of a touchback, I think the Ravens would be here. I think that play and Ravens, uh, Flowers losing that ball and Flowers' immaturity cost them, absolutely cost them a chance to go to the Super Bowl. No question about that. We will... Get into the game in depth with prediction. I don't think I've hidden the fact too much that I'm going to pick the Chiefs. Uh, but we'll do all that, break the game down, do all that with our Football Friday uh, podcast. Uh, when we come back, email. You're listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Uh, send your emails to Mike Francesa podcast at gmail.com. Mike Francesa podcast at gmail.com. Whatever's on your mind. Before we start, let me say one thing. I tweeted something the other day. I went to the, uh, I took Harrison to the uh, St. John's UConn game, which was, you know, had a real old time feel to it. Sellout, great anticipation before the game, great energy in the building, the whole deal. Okay. St. John's had a lead at half, and then UConn just buried him in the second half. And they didn't even have, the, uh, you know, their third best player, Caravan, didn't play. Um, UConn's a legitimately Final Four team and, and probably the best team in the country. I think they're better than Purdue. Um, and I think right now UConn and Purdue are, right, at this point, as we hit the second week of February and we're a month away from the conference tournaments, uh, UConn and, and, and Purdue are, I put Houston third. I worry a little bit about their offense and their foul shooting. Um I think those two teams are clearly ahead above everybody else. And UConn has a very good chance to win another championship. Um, I, I said something after the game. I tweeted something. I said, you know, great scene. UConn was terrific. 
But I sit here and talking to some coaches before the game and talking to some people, I feel like we are on the eve of destruction when it comes to college athletics. And I really believe that. It's over. It, as we know it, it's over. And then you may have saw that yesterday, may have seen that yesterday. The NLRB ruled, and I'm sure this ruling will be appealed, but there's also three or four other states where the schools are getting ready to do the same thing. The NLRB ruled that Dartmouth players were within their rights to unionize, that they were deemed school employees. If you listen to me years ago, I told you this was going to be the thing that ended everything. When the players, if this was going to happen, if they were going to start to pay the players, after the Ed O'Banion case and the whole thing, it was going to lead to unionization. Once it led to unionization, it's over. They're not student athletes anymore. They're employees. They don't have to go to class. They can be paid any amount of money. They're going to have freedom of movement. They're going to also have all kinds of things like work conditions. They're going to have a union rep. What, what happens? You want to chastise a player? He tells you, call my union rep. This is over. That's why coaches are getting out by the droves. As one coach at a mid-major said to me, I'm like a minor league manager. If I develop a player, he's gone. If I have a freshman, I develop into a good player. He's gone. He's getting bought to a new team next year. He's gone. I can't keep him for three more years and develop him. I can't have a run with a, with a nucleus. Any player from a secondary league who makes all league and returns is bought by a major team. This is over as we know it. And now we're staring at unionization of the players. What does student athlete mean? There's no student athlete. They're pros. They're employees. And they can unionize. That means OSHA. That means pensions. That means union reps. It's all over, folks. It's all over. And with it goes the appeal. And you want to call it a sham? Okay. Did they try to sell you that they were Harvard Monday to Friday and Alabama on Saturday? Yes. Did they do things under the table, a lot of the schools? Yes. Has the system had a corrupt feel to it at times over the years? Yes. But it wasn't chaotic and it wasn't pervasive. Now it is over. How can you coach if you get a freshman, develop him, and the next year he goes somewhere else for $5 million? He's gone. He has freedom of movement. Every single player can move. How can you build a program if every player can leave you after one year? How would you think major leagues would work? How do you think baseball would work or the NBA would work if every player was free to leave every season? Chaos. Chaos. And that's what you have now. Chaos. Plus, Hey, why doesn't Harvard just in the next couple of years take a chunk of that endowment that they have, which is so much bigger than any other school in the country, and decide, you know what? We're going to build the best basketball program in America and win the NCAA championship. Could they do it? Absolutely. They start paying at $5 million a year, you know, for a starter, you know, and on down. Plus, you get to say you went to Harvard. You don't have to go to class. You just say you went to Harvard. You don't have to go to class anymore. Why would you have to go to class? You're an employee. You're not a student. You can just wear a Harvard uniform and say you went to Harvard. This is over, folks. It's over. As we know it, it is over. And with it, what's over is this playoff they just put together in college football. It's not going to exist. And the NCAA tournament is not going to exist. Because there's not going to be college athletics. Because the it's over. It's now minor leagues. And the minor leagues, tell me this, where is the minor leagues big deal? Where, is it ha where does it have appeal? Where does it have charm? Who cares about the minor leagues? Nobody. 
it's a ground to build and develop and then send them off to the majors. Well, that is what college athletics has always been in a quasi way, but not, it always had tradition and charm. Tradition, rivalries, and charm. Now it has Zippo. We are on the eve of destruction. It is over. It is completely, there's no way to put it back in the bottle. They're now employees. They're now professionals. So you can't make them go to class. Why, who cares if they go to class? What do you care? There's, no, there's not going to be any, any as, as Patino said after the game the other day, and he hates the NCAA anyway, obviously, but he said, hey, the NCAA is done. Yeah, they are done. They can't have enforcements. Enforce what? They're pros. What are you enforcing? You're going to tell them now they're not going to class? You're going to tell them now that they gave them a T-shirt or they paid for a kid to go home? The kid can now make $5 million and go there. He can have his own net jet deal. It's over. There's no more amateurism. There's no more student athlete. That stuff is nonsense. Take the commercials and throw them away. There's no student athlete anymore. They're professionals. And it's complete chaos. They don't even know what to do now. No one even knows what the rules are. You try like hell to protect every player. You know, the new the Washington coach just went to Alabama. Do you know how many players he lost? He got raided before he even got there. Deion Sanders said, you know what, I'm going to go out and pluck players from every school. Give me money. Give me a bundle of money. Hey, this is what Bear Bryant said when he went to Texas A&M. Throw the money in the jar, guys, and I'll give you a good team. That's what they did. Yes, that's what they did then. That's how he built a good team. He didn't stay there very long, but that's how he built a good team. And he worked them to death. But he said, ante up. Now, every school is hiring an NIL director to do what? To ask the school to raise money so we can buy players. Some schools are saying, we can't compete. Of course you can't compete. But think about it. Everyone's saying, I can't compete with football with the SEC teams. Hey, think about this. None of you can compete with Harvard. None of you can compete with Yale. None of you can compete with Texas A&M if they want to get involved with all their endowment money. Enjoy the tournament this year. The eve of destruction is upon us. Now, Jason, for me as a Mets fan, I can understand the moves that Stearns has made. But did the Mets have a productive offseason to be competitive next season? What the Mets did, and listen, they brought Stearns in here because they think he's a smart guy who can build a lasting team. All right? Cohen got in here and thought his, he could do a fast money deal and win a championship. And then he said, you know what? I can't. I want to build something that lasts. So he went and got a smart guy. He tried to hire Theo. He and Theo couldn't get together. Theo wanted points. They, he denies it. They, that, bottom line is that's what happened. Theo wanted ownership. The Cone said no. All right? So he gets Stearns. I don't like the way Stearns handled Buck. I don't like the way he handled Epler. But he decided, you know what? Yeah, we're going to go after Atani. Yeah, we're going to go after Yamamoto. But, you know, we didn't get either one of them. So we're not going to throw big money after players that don't deserve that money. Let me take a look at what we have for a year. Let me see what I need, where I need to throw the money, and then we'll start to throw the money at it. And that's what he sold the owner on. So this is a year where... He will, you know, they have the pitching lab. They brought in a lot of arms. They hope they can reclimate in the bullpen. He's a bullpen guy. And you go into a season, folks, 
And here's the thing you think about. I got 1,458 innings, nine times 162. I got to have somebody pitch those innings, and I hope that a lot of them are quality. The Mets are saying, we're going to complete most of those out of the bullpen. We got Senga, but Senga threw 166 innings last year. He's not durable. He's really good, but he's not durable. Only threw 166 innings. Not enough. And the guys they have now are five-inning starters, if you're lucky. You'll hope to get five quality out of them. They still need starting pitching. And there's still starting pitchers out there. Bottom line is Mets do not have a – the Mets have a team that if, they, if, if, if everything fell into place, they could win 87 games. If they don't, they'll probably win somewhere around 77, 80 games. Their lineup's not terrible. Their pitching's awful. The starting pitching is dreadful. Do they have a team that's competitive? If you're talking about for the playoffs, no. For 500? Yeah. Austin, do you think the NFL will ever get its wish of playing the Super Bowl on Sunday before President's Day? Austin, if you listen to my show, I talked about this 10 to 15 years ago, that the dream the NFL had was to play an 18-game schedule. They've got it to 17 and to play the Super Bowl over President's Weekend. The Monday after the Super Bowl is the most absenteeism of any day of the year in America. We know that. They want to control that weekend. They want to move deeper into February. I've talked about this 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago now. Uh, Goodell is right on the verge. If you notice, go look at when... Joe Namath won the Super Bowl. I think it was January 12th. This is February 11th, the game. The the Super Bowl, since it started, has moved back a month. They're one week away from getting the President's Weekend. They will get it. I've heard people say the game should be Saturday. Those are people who don't know what they're talking about. The game will always be Sunday. The NFL owns Sunday. Sunday is the biggest viewing day of the week in TV by far. Why would you give up Sunday and play on Saturday? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Okay, the bottom line is they'll play on Sunday and eventually they'll play President's Weekend. I don't know what year he'll get it past the players. The players surprised me by voting down playing 18. They grudgingly gave 17. They have given 17 over 18 weeks. They will eventually give uh, 18 over 20 weeks and get two buys in the season. I think that'll be what was negotiated. Two buys into a season, 18 over 20 weeks. 18 games, 20 weeks of schedule, and then they'll play uh, on President's Weekend. I think it will happen um, within the next five years. Maybe, yeah, let's say five years. Dan, how can the Giants justify resigning Barkley? Uh, he's older. $11 million last year. Doesn't make sense. Dan, I don't think they will resign Barkley. And if you notice... On the free agent market this year are Barkley, Jacobs, Henry, Eckler, Pollard. Why? Because running backs don't get paid. And they don't care if they walk. And no one wants to sign any running back to a second big contract. And if you've put five years in at running back and been a starting running back in this league for five years, they think that you are already on the other side of the mountain. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, they are right. Of that group, of that group, Henry has been a battering ram. You don't want to re-sign him for money. Jacobs is a battering ram. You don't want to re-sign him for money. Barkley's been hurt too much. You don't want to sign him for money. I would sign Pollard. Pollard's better as the number two guy rather than the one guy. He did not have a good year as the one guy last year. And Eckler, I think somebody will take a shot on because he catches the ball really well, and he hasn't been abused, and he scores a lot of touchdowns. David, is Brunson the best Nick since Ewing? I don't think you can do that yet. I think he has done things 
at a higher level already than anybody's done since Patrick. But it's about the playoffs. It's not about the regular season. The NFL regular se- the NBA regular season is a complete farce. Complete embarrassment is what it is. Uh, nothing short. It's a joke. So it's about the playoffs, and he's got to do it in the playoffs. Sean, if the Knicks sign LeBron James with the current roster, would it make them a championship contender despite his age? No. He's too old. LeBron can still get his 25 or 30 points. He can still get his assists and rebounds, but he no longer can play defense. He has been in the league 20 years. He is a freak of nature, but it has taken its toll. He can't do it over a long period of time, and he can't do it on the defensive end of the floor. So you're not getting the same two-way play. So he's not the same player anymore. The problem with bringing LeBron in here is it would cause too many changes to be made into the way their chemistry is set up now that it would be detrimental because they're a team that plays with defensive integrity and lets Brunson do what he wants. And with LeBron here, he has to have the ball because he's a passer too. He's a facilitator. And it's not going to work. He's not right. You want the right guy? Okay. The right guy, the magic guy, the guy that if you slid him in, watch out, is not going to happen. If they could get bridges from the Nets by giving up so many things that they have in terms of contracts, in terms of first round picks without denting the core. And I'm not talking about Randall. I'm talking about the core as it is right now. And I'm counting Robinson in that core. They could win a championship with Bridges. I think Bridges would be absolutely perfect. I don't think they can get him. So I don't think the Nets would trade with the Knicks. Secondly, I don't think they could get him without disturbing the nucleus. Jeff, curious to know what your plans normally are for Super Sunday. Uh, where do you watch the game? Blah, have a gathering, blah, blah, blah. I, first of all, spent most of my life at the Super Bowl. I used to decide... My big decision was, was I going to stay for the game and then deal with flying home and getting back for the Monday show and everything else? Or was I going to go home after the work week and watch the game at home? In later years, I was 50-50. If I loved the game or I had some reason that I really was, the game appealed to me, I went to the game. Plus, I have to admit, as my boys got older, they wanted to go to the games, and I took them to the two or three games. I think I took them to three. It might have been four. It was either three or four. Um, since I left fan, I've taken them to one. I took them to the Kansas City-San Francisco game in Miami. Uh, So we drove to the game because we were in Florida anyway. So, um, and we went to the game. Julio, myself, Jack, and uh, we all went to the game. And Julio's a Niner fan and has a Kansas City fan. So, you know, it was, they had a lot of stake. I took Jack to, uh, and his friends to the game in Atlanta, Rams and Pats, uh, which was a terrible game. Beautiful stadium, but terrible game. Um, I've been to, you know, in my life, over 30-something Super Bowls. So, I mean, it got to be old hat. As far as now, uh, in later years, I prefer watching the games just with my boys. Or My wife's a good football fan. She understands football. She's been around it her whole life. Her, bro- her brothers were football players. Um, so we just watch it with, with, with my family. Um, We'll have a couple people over on Super Sunday. I don't go to anybody's house on Super Sunday. I watch it here. And we might have a couple people over that, you know, I think we're having four or five people over this week. And we'll watch the game. 
with the family and with uh, whoever's coming home from college and, you know, watch the game here. Harrison would be what, crazy because he's a Chief fan. Um, so a uh, small group, and we just watch it here like everyone else does. Uh, but I always watch it at home. Yeah. I mean, because I go down and do a podcast afterwards. So I would do that anyway. So I like watching the games with a small group or just me. I don't like watching the games in a large group, and I don't like not being home when I watch the games. I prefer to be home. Um, how come no one mentions Steve Spagnolo as a head coach? Good question. A lot of success. Uh, mainly because he was dreadful as a head coach. Now, he didn't have two full bites at the apple. Spags, who's had incredible success and is a huge factor in the game this week, had a great game plan for Baltimore, uh, has had a great year with his young defense. Um, the bottom line is uh, he had three years in St. Louis, and his third year was – his first year was dreadful. Second year was bad. His third year was dreadful. He got fired. Third year he went 2-14. and 14. He won like 11 games in three years in St. Louis. He was an interim with the Giants. I think he went 1-3 and three in the four games he was the interim. He's now 64 years old, and he has resigned himself to the fact that he is an elite coordinator. He gets treated with great respect. He impacts the game and the team dramatically. He gets paid very well. His base pay is, I think, somewhere between 2 and $3 million, and I'm sure he has bonuses based on Super Bowls and everything else. Um, so he gets paid very handsomely. He's making a lot of money, and he gives him free reign in the defense and great respect, always acknowledges him. So he's in a perfect spot, and he understands that his job is to be a dominant coordinator. There's nothing wrong with that. He has a pivotal job in this league. And why not be that? Why not be a great, dominant, defensive coach rather than a mediocre head coach of a franchise that, if you're lucky, might get to the playoffs a couple of times? Hey. He found his place. He took his swing. It didn't work. He was smart enough not to take another swing if he could have, or he has stayed out of it. Now he's 64, so he doesn't even think about it anymore. He now just does his job. He's found his home. And you know what? I'd rather be that. I'd rather be the number two man on a Chiefs dynasty then be a mediocre head coach somewhere. Because he impacts players. He impacts the league. Everybody knows who he is. Everyone respects him. And that's a lot. That's plenty. So remember, we will do a Football Friday cast for you. We will break down the game. I'll, I'll give you what I expect how I think the game will be played. I think it's going to be a very good game. I think that San Francisco is worthy of respect, and I think you're looking at not a good offense, but a great offense. One of the best offenses to hit the league in a long time. I mean, they have great players on offense. Purdy's not one of them, but they have great players. Wonderful talents. I mean, Trent Williams is a great player. He's a Hall of Famer. McCaffrey's a tremendous player. He's a future Hall of Famer. Kittle is a tremendous talent. Debo, Ayuk, that's a lot of guys on one offense. And then put Purdy in there. And the Purdy you saw with a dry ball because he doesn't throw a good wet ball. And opening up as he did last week in the second half. 
you saw an offense that, you know, just took off in the second half. But Kansas City is better at quarterback, has an edge in coaching, has a big edge at kicker, and I think is a little better on defense. That's a lot of edges for the Chiefs. Enjoy the day. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. 